Welcome to Worship with Austin United Methodist Church. Our worship staff includes Rev. Dr. Donna Dempy Wolf, Rev. Amanda Larson, musician Susan Hayes, as well as special guests each week. Whether you're on a break from work or cozied up with a cup of coffee, you are welcome here. Good morning. I am Pastor Donna Dempy Wolf, and I'm glad to welcome you to worship at First United Methodist Church in Austin, Minnesota. We are a congregation of all walks of life, families of all shapes and sizes, people of all points along the spiritual journey. Wherever you're at in your spiritual life, seeking or searching, questioning or wondering, hesitant or confident, we invite you to be fully present in this sacred space and to listen to the one who offers you new life, who knows you by name, who says to you, peace be with you. Now would you take a deep breath, Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, to renew you, and to open you to meet anew the wounded Christ, the risen Christ, in this time of worship. Holy Spirit, break Break through our hearts hearts and call us to love courageously. By your grace, boldly show us your vision for First Church. Open our eyes to see it, our minds to embrace it, and our hearts, hands, and feet to fulfill it. Amen.
Would you join me in a spirit of prayer? God of life, source of all being, in whom we live and breathe and have our being, we come together in prayer, even though many struggle with what that means. We come together to stand before that which is greater than us, even if we come with more questions than answers. And so, on this day, we pray for those things we struggle with, for the conflicts we feel within ourselves and between us and those we love. We pray, God of life, for guidance, compassion, for the opening of a path. We pray for those things that give us joy and hope, for those things that we trust in, believe in, and even those things that raise questions or doubts. For these are, all of them, gifts of grace. And perhaps we need not define them in order to savor them, rejoice in them, be thankful for them. We pray especially today for Ashley and Samuel, who will confirm their faith during our in-person service. Even if they, like us, don't have it all figured out yet, they are still saying yes to your way of love and life. O oh God of new life, even as we celebrate, we know that we gather, even in this virtual space, with all kinds of needs. Some are facing serious physical challenges and our need of healing. We pray especially for Jackson and Jack, who have leukemia, and young Jocelyn, who continues her chemotherapy. We pray, O oh God, for healing and comfort. Others need healing of a different kind, emotional or spiritual. Some are facing family problems. Some are weary with the struggles of life and seek assurance that this will someday pass. Others face financial difficulties and a spectrum of difficult decisions for themselves and their families. For each of us, we speak the deepest prayers of our hearts in different ways. We each come seeking wholeness, but it looks and feels different for each one of us. May we meet you in our similarities, in our unity of spirit, and in our differences, even in our differences of how we understand your presence in the world. And may we always, God of life, hold in our hearts gratitude for those things that bless us with your presence, forgiveness for the ways we have turned from those blessings, and the willingness to open ourselves anew to this beautiful and hurting world. Together we join our voices and pray the words that Jesus, our wounded healer, our risen Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked. For, the, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced. When they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, you are forgiving them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, um, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Your hand, and put it on your side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet to come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
and that though believing you may have a name in a life in his name. Today is the second Sunday of Easter. Today we hear about Jesus' appearance to Thomas and the disciples. Last Sunday we heard of Jesus and his appearance to Mary on Easter morn. There's also the story of Jesus appearing to two men on the road to Emmaus, and to Peter and the disciples on the side of a beach. If you sense a theme here, there is. The appearance of the risen Christ. We mentioned it last week, now this week again. Wouldn't once be enough? It takes a while to come to grips with the idea that Jesus rose from the dead. It took those closest to him days, weeks, months, years to comprehend the reality and meaning of his dying and rising. In today's scripture reading that Ashley and Samuel just read, the disciples are behind closed doors. When Jesus appears to them saying, peace be with you, he then breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. It was Easter evening. Absent was one of the disciples, Thomas. So the others go and tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas replies, unless I put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. That is why we call him Doubting Thomas. Though that is a misnomer. He might better be called Questioning Thomas. Thomas had questions and he wasn't afraid to ask them. Earlier in John's Gospel, in the 14th chapter, Jesus is speaking somewhat cryptically about his departure and how he is preparing a place for all who follow him. Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I am going to prepare a place for you, and you know the way to the place I am going. But they don't have a clue. Thomas has the courage to acknowledge what the others must be thinking. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? It is not doubt, but self-assurance that leads Thomas to acknowledge that for him, Jesus was not making any sense. This in turn leads Jesus to speak one of the most memorable passages in the New Testament. I am the way and the truth and the life. In the story for today, Thomas must have felt that the disciples weren't making any sense. After all, when a person dies, that's it. You can be injured and come back. You can get sick and come back. You can be in a coma and come back. But you don't die and come back. That just doesn't happen. Thomas replies, unless I put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Elaine Pagels, in her book Beyond Belief, suggests that Thomas did not quit questioning or challenging after Jesus appeared to him. It is well known by church historians that Thomas had written his own account of the life of Jesus called The Gospel of Thomas. It contains the teachings of Jesus though in variations that are similar to, yet different from, the Gospels we know. Whereas John quotes Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, Thomas quotes Jesus saying, the light is within you. Thomas has some distinct miracle stories, like the time Jesus was five and molded little sparrows from mud. He claps his hands and the birds come to life and fly away. His father Joseph watches this in amazement and then scolds Jesus for performing this work on the Sabbath. Pagels contends that John and Thomas were rivals and ultimately John's gospel won out and was included in the Christian scriptures. Consider how John is portrayed in his gospel. He's called the beloved disciple. He's seated next to Jesus at the Last Supper. He is the one to believe on Easter morn. Thus, John looks like the true believer. And Thomas? He just doesn't get it. He needs proof. Pagel's key point, however, is that there wasn't uniformity of thinking in the early church, but great diversity of thought. 
Thomas, it appears, is a lifelong questioner, a lifelong learner. And one thing I hope that we are as a church is a group of questioners, people who ask questions, who delve deeper, who explore faith, people who are not content with easy answers. It may be harder to believe these days. Science has taught us to base our knowledge on facts. Though scientists know that there's nearly as much faith needed in science as in religion. And when it comes to faith, there are things we know, and there are things we don't know. We know that Jesus walked the earth. We know that he was an itinerant Jewish rabbi. We know he was put to death on a cross. We don't know physiologically what happened on Easter morn. We do know, somehow, that after his death, Jesus' presence and power was so real that it changed fearful, fearful followers into people of courage, who were filled with the Spirit, who went out to transform this world that God so loves. There are some things we know, and some things we don't know. If we want absolute certainty, irrefutable facts, we are not going to get them. That's why this venture that we're on is called faith. But here's what sets Thomas apart. He wasn't just a questioner. He wasn't just a critic. He wasn't just saying, what about this? What about that? He was a lifelong learner. He immersed himself in learning and growing and following the life and teachings of Jesus. Frederick Buechner puts it this way, Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. So remember, it's okay to have doubts. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to say, I don't know. Just continue to follow, even if you haven't figured it all out. Now back to the story. Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas responded, My Lord and my God. During the Baroque period, Italian painter Caravaggio captures a scene in his painting called The Incredulity of Thomas. In the painting, we see Jesus, arms open, his stab wound exposed to Thomas. And there's Thomas examining the wound, plunging his fingers up to the knuckle in the Christ side. It's pretty gruesome. It's a full contact Christianity. Thomas is literally immersing himself in Christ. Do you know anyone like Thomas? They're difficult at first. They question, they ask for more information, they process data on their own terms. But once they understand, once they see the big picture, they put themselves wholeheartedly into any endeavor. They are the kind of person you want as a friend, as a colleague, as a teammate, as a sojourner in faith. Thomas is a model for us, questioning yet immersing ourselves in the journey of faith. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We might also add, based on Thomas's example, blessed are those who immerse themselves fully in following Christ. During Holy Week, we remember the events that led to Jesus' crucifixion. We immersed ourselves in the stories, the music, the traditions, the symbols. We immersed ourselves so we remember. And as we remember, so we see the living God come alive on Easter morn at work in the tragedies and triumphs of today. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe, and those who have immersed themselves fully, who live boldly. So how do we immerse ourselves today? Here are some suggestions. Read the Bible and pray daily. Worship weekly. Share your talents, music, writing, painting, visiting, caring, listening, serving. Contemplate, advocate, doubt, question. Nothing shapes our lives more than the questions we ask or refuse to ask. So ask questions. Questions such as, 
Where do we see God in our daily lives? Where is God calling us to integrate our inner and outer lives? Where is God leading us to immerse ourselves as people of faith? Not individually, but with others. Because if we try to do it by ourselves, we might give up too easily. We need others to encourage us, to walk with us, moving together, growing spiritually together, serving together, asking questions together. We call it Wesleyan accountability. Remember, big questions lead to a big faith. So like Thomas, immerse yourselves in the questions and live them. I'll close with these words from poet Mar Mariah Rolke. And he writes, I want you as much as you can to be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign language. Do not seek the answers that cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Immerse yourself in them now. Perhaps you will gradually, without noticing it, live some distant day into the answers. Friends, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And blessed are those who immerse themselves fully, who lived boldly, who lived courageously. Friends, immerse yourself fully in faith. a flower in the seed and apple tree in cocoons a hidden promise butterflies will soon be free in the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until it's season something God alone can see there's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds, a mystery. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death a resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed. Until it's season, something God alone can see. Friends, big questions lead to a big faith. So go forth, ask your questions, and while you ask, immerse yourself in the way of Jesus, because it's by living our faith fully that we live into the answers. Go forth, be blessed, in the name of the Creator, the wounded healer and the sustainer. Amen.